Welcome to Living Legacy Leadership, where we explore, discover, and share insights, tools, and strategies for a life well-lived into elderhood. I'm your host, Donna Kim Brand, author, speaker, legacy strategy coach, and creator of the concept Living Legacy, where you choose to live life on your own terms while contributing to people, places, and projects along your life journey. I believe that the life you live is the legacy you leave. Now, the guests I bring to you each week all address some unique aspect of learning, leadership, or legacy. This helps you raise your own game as a leader in business and life and also showcases some extraordinary people who exemplify living legacy leadership. At least once a month, I also offer a training session to skill you in game-changer thinking for your own application. So get your notebook ready or sharpen up your memory by tuning in your attention and we'll dive right in. Well, I've brought you today one of those extraordinary people exemplifying living legacy leadership. She is Leslie Gray Streeter. She's an entertainment columnist for the Palm Beach Post. Her writing's been featured in the Miami Herald, Modern Loss, many other places. And she's taken up speaking engagements, um, including an annual appearance at Camp Widow, which we'll ask her about. It's a program of Soaring Spirits International an organization for widowed men and women that reaches nearly 500,000 people and a series of book club events for women. Now, uh, Leslie happens to live in my town, my city. She is a local celebrity. And now I have to say, Leslie, you, you've you um, jumped up to national celebrity because you were just on the Today Show with Hoda and Jenna. How was that? It was really fun. It was stuff like, you know, I have no chill. I saw you walk and go, <laughs> so I am not chill about any of it. Um, it was really fun. It was interesting. We were supposed to have done it on a, like in the studio back in April, and then that was canceled when things started to go bad and no one was just doing anything in front of audiences or whatever. So um, we found out a week before they had rescheduled it, you know, talk about grief, which is obviously something that everyone is talking about right now and grappling with. So um, with myself and David Kessler, the very famous grief writer, and he's really accomplished. And I'm like, I, I feel like I'm the, you know, the circus clown. I'm like, okay, I'll come too. Yeah, it was fun. Well, you know, you talked about grief, but they also were checking in with you about resilience and you are the ambassadress for resilience. So, you know, you're that. right up there with the best of them. Thank you. So mostly we want to chat about the new book you've written called Black Widow, a sad, funny journey through grief for people who normally avoid books with the words like journey in the title. (laughs) You're such a hoot. Um, So, yeah, you know, the book, of course, um, is a mix of witty humor and observations and at the same time gut wrenching realities of, of your life and what you've been through. So could you set the scene for our listeners of what's the, the gist of the story of black widow? Well, basically when people ask what it was about before it came out, I said it was like, um, Joan Didion's the year of magical thinking, but funnier and with black people. Oh. And that's, you know, there you go. It's a book about widowhood. It's a book about, what happens after loss and sort of finding your way back to whatever your new thing is. It's about adoption and living with your mom again and aging and journalism and race and friendship and weight loss. And it's just about, you know, I threw everything. There are probably like eight other themes that got cut out because my editors are like, this is not the series. It is a book. So <laughs> it was a lot. Mm. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I wish you had actually had a little pocket at the back for a tissue. Um, and it would oh. have to be a heavy duty one because literally as people, and I noticed that the first testimonial on the back is from James Patterson and he had the yeah. same experience I did where he said, black widow will make you laugh and cry sometimes on the same page. So it was amazing. I you appreciate to- that. Yeah. So what was it like? Um, I know James interviewed you and uh, how, how, what it, was it like dealing with him? I mean, he's, you know, number one in the book publishing. He, he's a lovely person. Um, I met him 
not long after I moved here because he emailed, he sent me a letter um, and a book. And he said, I, I moved to Palm Beach. I read your stuff. I think you're funny. I was like, what's happening? Uh, so <laughs> we, we haven't been like, you know, like super duper best friends, but he's been incredibly kind to me and he's given me advice. Um, yeah, I see him every once in a while, like just out, like at the movie theater or at a restaurant. And I've had an you know, occasion to interview him several times in the last, you know, 18 years. So I ran into him last year and he read my book and he was very helpful and actually, you know, got it to some people. Um, and he was really complimentary and, and great about it. And so when this opportunity came up to the event on Palm Beach, which was Literally, it was the week before my book came out, and it was right before everything went crappy. It was nice to get an event there, and it was actually the weekend, what would have been my 10th anniversary weekend of getting married at the same hotel at the Colony on Palm Beach. We got married on the lawn outside of the ballroom where we had this event. Wow. So it was, mm. and, and so many of the same people were there, which was really cool. I felt like we were having our big anniversary party, but Scott wasn't there. And that's why I party for both of us. It was fun. Hmm. Hmm. So, I mean, I have so many things I want to ask you, but, you know, you, you say in the book at some point you have an established history of things not going your way. I mean, would you say the pandemic sort of caught uh, putting the, the the skids on your book tour um, oh, in that category? That how- those, <laughs> yeah, where you just, it was really, it sounds so selfish, but it was hard not to take it personally. I mean, of course, I couldn't take it personally because <laughs> people died, right? My life has been altered, but not in a in the worst way. I mean, I didn't take my book tour, but I get to work from home. I live in a home. I have Wi-Fi. I can more than afford to pay my rent. I can more than afford to eat, sometimes a lot. You know, I could afford the expensive diet program, Noom, that I'm on to lose the weight that I gained. Um, so I have a lot of privilege in that, but it didn't go the way that, I expected it to go, but it didn't go. Nothing went the way anyone expected anything to go. So I'm not alone in that. Mm. But yeah, I was like, for real, for real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been getting a lot of press because the book speaks for itself in a sense. And then you, you help that along for sure um, with your zesty personality. So, you know, we're creeping up on July, which makes it, is it five years since Scott passed? Five years. Yep. July 29th. Yep. So can I ask, I mean, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I mean, I think that you got the Eeyore, as can be expected. But, um, you know, I think that I, I was speaking to a woman who um, whose podcast I'm doing in a little bit, who's a widow, earlier about this, where whoever you're grieving is not um, linear, you know, so... I am not in the same place I was five years ago uh-huh. after that happened, you know, because I, I, I am glad that I'm not. It would be not great if I was. I still get sad and I still miss him and stuff. But I mean, I have been able to move forward, not move on, not move past, but move forward. I mean, he, he as someone said today, I will always be his widow, you know, even if I got married again and you know, and was high on the hog and, you know, living in an undisclosed place that I didn't use a dress I didn't give to peasants. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I would still have been widowed and I still would have lost him. And there still would have been that loss. And that's part of my story, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that that happened, but I'm proud that he was part of my story. I wouldn't change anything about that other than him being gone. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't change, ha- change having been, in his life, even with the hurt, you know? Yeah. Well, aside from Jamie Fraser and uh, Claire on the Outlanders, you know, that people are like mm. over their relationship. I mean, you had, girl, what a lot of people really seek and never get, and that is true love. And I've seen you guys together, I saw uh, you guys together. And I mean, that's got to mean something to you, right? It really does. And it means. And it sounds very fatalistic, and this is the thing that happens on the Hallmark movies, and we're like, you know, that the hot plumber will show up tomorrow. But um, I really did, and I know that a lot of people don't get that. So I would like to find, you know, love again. But if I don't, I had a really good one. Some people don't get one. 
Mm. So I'm not trying to be greedy, except I am. <laughs> <laughs> I would like one. Thank you. But yeah. I understand that that doesn't always happen. So, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. And why not? Hmm. So a little buddy there, Brooks, um, he's about six now, is he? Six. He'll be seven in September. Yikes. Wow. Cool. And what I love, um, you talk about in the book how you chose his name. Now, my kids, I have three kids, and they their names all mean something. I was married first to a Korean, which is my name. My name is Kim mm. Bram. Kim is from you, being you. married to a Korean. A brand is the Englishman. But the children's first mm. names also have meaning. So could you explain how you chose his name? Scott chose his name. His name is his full name is Brooks Robinson Streeter Zorvitz. That's hyphenated. Um, Brooks Robinson is the um, legendary Baltimore Orioles third baseman and Scott's favorite player. And he that's who he is named after. And we actually got an opportunity about a month ago to be a part of a birthday Zoom call with Brooks and Cal Ripken and Eddie Murray and Ken, um, <laughs> Ken Singleton. Yes. And, you kidding um, me? Oh my gosh, my hair just stood yeah, up on my arms. Really, <laughs> it was really great um, because we just were at the end. We both of it, we were muted, but at the end, there were a bunch of kids from around the, the country who are named Brooks because it's a big thing. There's a writer, sports writer, who said um, in New York they named candy bars after Reggie Jackson, in Baltimore we name our kids after Brooks Robinson, and it's true. <laughs> there was there was one family who's somewhere in Florida who had a Brooks, a Cal, no, a Brooks a Ripken and a um, Camden after Camden Yards, the stadium. So I was like, that's hilarious. So, yeah. That's funny. It well, I fun. also, I love too, that you actually had a name. My daughter, um, who has a two-year-old, is also pregnant with um, a second child in a couple of months, hasn't revealed the name. But mm-hmm. I had this happen to me, and they, um, I'm, I'm sure they have a name in mind. But you had a name in mind, and when you held him okay. as, a, as a newborn... You said, you know what? That name doesn't feel like him. It just I didn't. Thought, he wasn't a Max. Yep. It was so weird because we were like, he's going to be Max. And then we met Matt. We met him and went, mm, no, no, that's not. I mean, he obviously had a birth name, um, yeah. but, you know, we decided to, to change that. Um, he's retained, you know, some parts of it. But his he we looked at him and thought, mm, no. It's hmm. not who you are. I don't know why. He just didn't feel like a Max. He felt like a Brooks, and he is a Brooks. And I was like, okay. And he didn't, like, you know, bite me or anything when I called him. I was like, okay, it's great. Yeah, fantastic. Well, and that's that, you know, I think because, you know, you, you are a writer in the entertainment industry, but I know you do improv, and the book, like you said, is all, funny as I'll get out, even going through grief and with some serious, uh, the whole serious um, impact on your life, but the the fact that you can tune in and pull the essence out of situations, I think that's just another example of that. Pretty Thank cool. you. Thank you. So you mentioned Camp Widow. I mean, yeah. is that kind of morose or is it really helpful and fun? Or, I mean, do you it go is, there? It and... is, it's, it's all of the things. It's all mm-hmm. of the things. It's because, you know, yeah, because you go, Camp Widow, you lose. You know, but <laughs> widows, when you're, there's something miraculous about being in a group of people that get you, that the defining experience in your life is also the defining experience in their life. And they're not going to judge you for it. They don't think you're weird. They don't have that initial thing that happens when you see someone who's grieving where you go, oh, whatever. Everyone's kind of like out there. And people are in different stages of healing and at different times along their, their timeline, you know. But it is, it is it can be very emotional. It can be really fun. Widows sometimes are drinkers. Um <laughs> It can be very huggy. It can be very dancey. There's always like a Saturday night event that's like dancing and stuff. It's fun. I've been both in Tampa several times and in Toronto last year. And it's been post the ones all the ones Tampa got 